There was a tremendous amount of change happening in the United States during the 1960s. These are the stories of the alum of Wilson College, classes 64 and 69. The, the school was fairly isolated. We didn't have the communications that we have today. So, so and, and the country was, was, was more passive than it is now. You know, it wasn't as diverse. It was very more homogeneous. And um, in spite of the fact that the school was in a conservative state and, and, and out of the mainstream of things, there was a strong culture here of um, helping people. And so there was interest in civil rights and interest in education and interest in those kinds of social, um, uh, finding solutions to social problems, whether you were conservative or liberal. That was kind of the nature of the student who was here. Yeah. We were starting to realize that people in numbers had allowed enough voice to be heard and that constructive, positive action on our part had over time the very real potential for effective, meaningful change. I never had the guts to become a marcher or to participate in sit-ins, the sort of activism that carried potential for getting roughed up or shot at or being jailed and arrested. But I had tremendous admiration for people who were willing to put themselves at risk for causes they felt strongly about. Our sophomore year was the election of John F. Kennedy Jr. There was such jubilation because people felt that there was a president of our generation, that that had never happened before, that every other president had been our father's president, and this was ours. And that was so exciting to everybody. Um, then, of course, too soon thereafter, that was that. John F. Kennedy's assassination occurred in the fall of my senior year. I had just come out of French class that Friday afternoon when I heard that the president had been shot. We had Lyndon Johnson, who was very hard to trust. But he went out of his way to assure the Equal Rights Amendments. I mean, the whole race issue was on the table for the first time. Certainly, civil rights was something we were aware of because we'd all come out of the schools in 1958. And I, and I went. To, I mean, I graduated from high school in '60, and my high school, my school, was this, my junior high school was segregated in Baltimore when I went there from New York City, so it was a big culture shock. Uh, not that New York City was so integrated, because it really wasn't. It was economically segregated, but, um, but not officially, you know. Classmates of mine marched in Washington for jobs and freedom in 1963, and in the year after our graduation, the Selma to Montgomery March in support of voting rights. I remember a vote during a WCGA meeting to boycott one of the restaurants in downtown Chambersburg because it had refused to serve a couple of Wilson's African-American students. I voted with the overwhelming majority for the boycott. I do remember that the vote to boycott the restaurant in Chambersburg found the school administration uncomfortably caught between showing support for the students' protest and concerns for maintaining good relations between the college and the Chambersburg's business community. We had a peace protest here my sophomore year. In 19, that would have been 60, spring of 62. We, um, and I'm trying to, there, we, there must have been a build up in Vietnam, something must have triggered this, but we, um, we put together a really good document and we presented it at the, con at, um, the convocation. And in other words, we got administrative support to invite the whole campus to come in and hear our issues, which is pretty amazing because we were just a, a small group of people, maybe 10 of us together who put it together. And we read it. Um, there were many of our classmates who didn't agree with us, and, and probably because they were hearing this for the first time, this kind of thing, probably because they just wanted to keep on knitting and forget about it and write to their boyfriends. All these things were you know, considered very, very suspect as we got farther into the war and, um, and the paranoia grew. We were very ladylike. Um, there was not a lot of 
protest one way or another. I and a group of friends wrote a statement against the Vietnam War. And we were considered to be quite radical because we were protesting the war in Vietnam. Because there were still a lot of, I mean, we were brought up to be very ladylike and submissive. I can remember we had a wonderful history, chairman of the history department was a woman named Helen Nutting. And a lot of us used to spend a lot of time at her house. <clears throat> and she had come from Bryn Mawr. And she had a friend, a professor at Bryn Mawr, who was here for the weekend. And we were all over there one night. And the woman from Bryn Mawr said to Helen, Oh, Helen, my campus radicals come to, you know, burn down the house and protest and march on Washington, and your campus radicals come over and polish your silver. <laughs> oh and that was true. That's true. Wow. We'd go to her house and polish your silver. Everybody talked about the war. No, but not too much talk about feminism at all. Right. At all. At all. I mean, it was still a time where a lot of parental expectations were that you were going to graduate and get married and be well taken care of for the rest of your life. And, you know, you were being educated so that you would be a, a, a better wife and mother, not to prepare you for anything. Let's see, Betty Friedan wrote... Feminine Mystique in 1963. Okay, I was a junior by then. I did not read it. My girlfriend's mother read it, and she tried to encourage us to read it, and we kind of laughed her off. Uh, I mean, we were busy dating, flirting, looking to get married, maybe, you know, having a very good time. And, um, and so I don't think we really thought much about feminism, but right after I graduated from Wilson, it hit me right between the eyes. I went to work, I went to interview for Time Magazine in New York City, and I had some pull there, um, and that's how I got the interview, but I had to get myself the job, and the first thing they asked me was um, how fast I could type, when I was a good typist. Um, because after leaving Wilson, I went to Radcliffe Summer School, they had a business school for young BAs, um, to train us to go work in the publishing industry, which meant shorthand and typing, because they put, it was really mad men. They put you behind a typewriter. And um, it helped if you were pretty, because then you got hired, you know, and you were still behind the typewriter. But um, I remember wanting to be a researcher, and that was something that Wilson taught me. If a real academic interest in academic subjects, and, 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 a, and gave me some skills to do research, and try to decipher what the truth was and find find the answers to things and, and that I learned here. So I was I wanted to use that skill. And they I said, well I'm gonna be a researcher. I said, I'm a good typist, but and I'll take your test, but this is where what I'm applying for. And they said, well we start you uh, as a secretary first. And I was sitting in the lobby with a boy with a Cornell BA and I know they were not giving him a typing test. And he was also applying to be a and we had a little chat about it. And then I just walked out of the office and I thought, nope, I'm not going to work in publishing. It's a dead end for women. And so I'm going to go to grad school. Uh, women, you know, certainly weren't taken seriously um, as far as our options for when we graduated would be teaching or nurses or, you know, something like that. It certainly was not, you know, what the gals have today. I wouldn't be Jane Preston Rose, I'd be Mrs. George Rose Jr. And I think, oh my gosh. I remember when I moved to uh, Kent, we were in Boston and went out to Kent, Ohio. My husband was going to graduate school and I went, he was a graduate student and I went to register to vote and see students weren't allowed to register, nor were their spouses. In Ohio, they said I had to register in New Jersey where he was from I never lived a day in my life in New Jersey. And um, so finally, one summer, he wasn't enrolled in school, so I went down and I said, you know, I was working and everything, paying taxes, and I went down and said, what's your husband doing? I said, he's unemployed. So they registered me. I thought, you know, if your husband's a no good bum, you can vote. If he's a graduate student, you can't vote. Mm -hmm. So then I joined the League of Women Voters and we since got that changed. And you know, you look at when we went to high school, mm -hmm. mid to late 50s, we graduated mm -hmm. in 60. 
um, you know, the presidential elections in 52, you know, Eisenhower and Stevenson, mm -hmm. but then Ike was reelected. There really wasn't uh, much going on. The music was still, you know, the mm -hmm. rock and roll and all that. But, you know, we had the music start changing. There were the Beatles uh, coming. Of course, they look so clean cut now. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was changing. But the people who graduated in 69 went to high school. You know, they started high school after Kennedy was elected. Mm -hmm. You know, they started the, the Civil Rights March, the Freedom Marches, the, um, you know, the Equal Opportunity Act. I mean, all those in 64, 63, 64. And uh, then they came to college.